Well, good morning, church. And today we're continuing on with our teaching of the Ascension gifts, uh, the fivefold ministries, and looking specifically at the field of the evangelist. Now, I love movies, and one of my favorite films is Schindler's List. It's one of the only movies that makes me really, truly, deeply sob as to what is going on. Now, the premise of Schindler's List, it's about uh, the rescue of Jewish people in amongst uh, Poland and occupied Poland by the Nazis. And Schindler is uh, an entrepreneur who sees the opportunity to make money by working with the Nazi government uh, in uh, his factories in Poland at the time. But while he's doing that, he all of a sudden becomes aware of the plight of the Jewish people and sees how they're being persecuted and treated through the gas chambers and just their general abuse in uh, the prisoner of war camps, and so to speak. Uh, so he decides to do something about it. In fact, he invests all his finances, he was a wealthy busy, businessman, in rescuing the Jewish people. In total, he saves something in the region of 1,200 people. But at the end of this movie, you see him going through his lists, trying to work out who he could have saved that he didn't manage to save. And if we're truthful about this, the field of the evangelist is the concern to save souls. It's not there to promote how many people I've saved, how many people I've been in the act of helping come to know the Lord Jesus. It's not about boasting. It's a concern primarily that people are saved and that they come through into the kingdom of God. And that the action or the result if they don't come and make a decision for Jesus is that they're going to suffer and die in hell. The evangelist wants the people to come through to life and life in its fullness. And this is his primary concern and his primary devotion to the saving of souls, just as his own soul has been saved by the grace of God. So the story we're going to look at today is it found in Matthew chapter 13. And it's a very famous parable called the parable of the sower. And we're also going to look at another parable as well called the parable of the wheat and the tares. And these two parables are set in fields. Now, in looking at these scriptures, I tend to see the field, although it's explained in the latter parable, the parable of the wheat and the tares, that the field is the world. I also think when we look at the parable of the sower, that again, the field is the world. It's the hearts and the minds and the souls of humankind that are, are able to receive the seed of God that has been sown into their lives. And the seed of God, as we find later on in the interpretations, is the word of God. So how are our souls or how are our beings able to receive God's gospel news, his good news. And that's why I call it the field of the evangelist. But equally so, it's not just the field of the evangelist, it's also the field of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher as well. You know, in the fact that they are so concerned about the word of God being received by humanity for humanity's benefit. But in the case of the evangelist, he is mainly concerned with seeing the lost becoming the found. The one who needs to be rescued from the flames, so to speak, and brought into life itself. But let's read the scripture. Matthew chapter 13, we're starting off verses 1 to 9. And I'm reading from the NIV. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times 
what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now, this is an interesting story because we read particularly in verse 4, as he was scattering the seed. Now, we have to go back in time and also to the practice that was happening in the ancient Near East. Because in our own mentality, when we are imagining wheat being grown in a field, we have nice hedgerows blocking off the field, a fence and a gate to stop people from going in. Everything's nice and neatly ploughed and ordered and the soil is ready to receive the seed. But that wasn't the practice that took place when the sowing of seed happened in the ancient Near East or in the time of Jesus. What happened was that a person would take seed and they would go out to a field and they would just scatter it out liberally. And it would be an abundance of seed that would be flowing out and going in all corners to the pathway trodden, to the rock, to all these different things. And then what would happen after the seed had been sown, they would go along with a plow to try and break up the ground. But obviously some ground wasn't able to break up as, as well as other ground that it was in the same field. And of course, people would walk all over the place. So there would be parts of the field that would be trodden pathways. There would be parts that would be rock because they didn't have the tractors like we have that had the power to break through the rock and to move the rock aside. And there would be other parts of the ground that would be scorched from the heat because they worked and operated in a climate much hotter than our own. And we tend to uh, do the ploughing off, obviously, after the rain so that the soil would break up easy and the seed would go underneath the ground. So there were all these obstacles that would take place uh, just as the seed was being scattered, just as it was being sown. It reminds me very much of a time when I was in a, a certain country and it was really very hot. And I was trying to preach the word of God to a group of people who were gathered. They were pastors who were gathered in a community uh, where it was illegal to hear the word of God being preached, particularly by somebody who was from a Western background. And I was standing in the middle of this church. Well, it wasn't a church hall. It was this hall in the middle of a, a venue which was unspecified, hiding away from the government and all the different authorities. And it was so hot that they decided, because I was a Westerner, I needed a fan. So they put the fan on me and the fan was blowing, but when it was about 40 degrees in temperature, it was just blowing hot heat onto you. It was like having a hairdryer blowing onto your face. They had the light shining on you, which was making it even hotter. And to make matters worse, all my notes were being scattered by the wind blowing all over the place. And it reminds me about this context here, that there's so many distractions going on trying to stop the word of God being spread because we learn later on in the next couple of verses that the seed that's being scattered is the word of God. And in any way that you see God's word being propagated or being promoted, equally at the same time you find all these different things coming in to stop the seed being sown in the first place or its effect in how it hits the ground or where it lands. And we have to be mindful when we're talking about evangelism, when we're talking about speaking into the hearts and minds of those who haven't heard the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many different obstacles that will come against us, who are the evangelists, because we're all called to be evangelizing our faith. We're all called to be missionaries. We're all called to propagate the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there will be so many things that try to come against us from being able to share our hearts on this matter. But equally so, there are so many obstacles coming against people being able to receive the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So much that is uh, out there in the Christian uh, arena of trying to propagate mission uh, doesn't have room for the gospel of Jesus. So we could ask the question, ourselves the question, is it truly mission? You know, where you're restricted, you've got to be careful what you say. You know, you can do good things, good works, but you can't preach the gospel. And the question I have to ask is, if you can't preach the gospel, why should you do the good works? The gospel and the good works go hand in hand. 
One is the donkey leading the cart, the cart that follows after, so that people realize the reason why we do the good works is because of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for his gospel, if it wasn't for the transformation in our lives of hearing the word and our hearts being changed and renewed, we wouldn't be doing the good works that we're doing. So the church needs not to neglect the work of the evangelist in speaking the good news of what Jesus has done and how he has transformed our lives. So Jesus talks about this story, and it's a relatively plain story about how a sower goes out to sow and how he goes out to uh, plant the seed and where the seed lands and all this type of thing. And it's pretty normal. So the crowds listen to the story and they're thinking, what is this story all about? Until you get to the ending and you learn at the end that the seed that falls on the good soil produces a crop. Well, that's obvious. Even the audience would be like, yeah, that's, that's just a plain story. What's this relevance got for me? Well, the crop that is uh, reaped or produced is a phenomenal crop. It's not a small thing. It's not the typical normal crop that you would produce from sowing the seed. It's a miraculous crop. It's something that you've never heard of before. So in the fact that Jesus has told this story, you could say it's an ordinary story except for the ending. And isn't that like the gospel, the life of Jesus? Yes, there are extraordinary things that goes on. He heals the sick, he, he raises the dead, all these things which are extraordinary. But really, I mean, he's a carpenter. He's from an ordinary background. He has an ordinary life. He's not a king. He's not famous in that sense. He's not something to look at, as some of the Gospels refer to. Uh, But this story at the end is phenomenal. This man who dies on a cross for our sins, for our trespasses, who's done no wrong, he dies. He's buried. But there's a harvest that is produced He raises from the dead on the third day. He offers forgiveness from sins. He transforms our lives. He sends the person, the Holy Spirit, that he may dwell in us. And that person may help us to lead good lives, to teach others about who he is, in the know and the sure fact that when we die, we true will be raised from the dead like him. So, such an ordinary story and our lives can be so ordinary but there is a power that is in our lives and an ending that will be extraordinary that we will be raised from the dead just like him so the disciples came to Jesus in verse 10 and asked him why do you speak to the people in parables he replied because the knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you but not to them Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So the disciples are asking the question, why are you speaking in this story? Because the people don't understand it. They don't see it. They can't perceive it. And Jesus says, that's right, because I don't want them to hear it. I don't want them to perceive it. And so you ask yourself the question, is that not unfair? You know that those who see it, those who perceive it, they have the abundance. And those who don't will have what they have taken away from you. Well, to understand this, we need to understand what happened in Matthew chapter 12. 
in Matthew chapter 12, there was an attack that came against Jesus, accusing him of being filled with demons. And it is from this point forward that Jesus stops speaking plainly about the kingdom of God. He starts to ramp up speaking in a parable way about the kingdom of God. He changes his tact. Before that, when the crowds were receptive, all of a sudden Jesus is plowing into them words of wisdom and who speaks like this? They're talking about Jesus. But when the resistance comes against the gospel of Jesus and the accusation and the finger pointing that comes and says that this is done by a demon, this is evil, this is not good, then Jesus changes his tact. And so should evangelists. When they're preaching the good news of Jesus and when people are open to the good news of Jesus, they speak plainly. But when there's an attack, they start to realize that actually they have to be careful in how they speak and how they say things because they don't want the church to become persecuted by those whose hearts are calloused towards the gospel and are seeking to destroy God's kingdom rather than building it up or even be open to the kingdom of God. So he starts to speak in parables and he explains the reason why using the term or the text Isaiah chapter 6. If you remember the text Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And there's a commissioning of Isaiah that goes on. And in verse, in chapter 6 it says, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. In other words, what, what God is saying to Isaiah is that you're going to speak to my people who need to hear my word but they're not going to receive my word and in not receiving my word it's okay for you to continue to preach and this is what the parable of the sower is all about the field of the evangelist is all about is the reality that the majority of the people will not receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Just in the parable of the sower, we see three types of soil which doesn't receive the good news of Jesus Christ, or if it receives it, it doesn't hold on to it. It doesn't maintain it. And the last, the good soil, is the one that receives the good news, and then there is a harvest that's produced. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we receive God's word? What do we do with it? Is it like falling on ground that isn't receptive? Or are we the good soil that receives God's word and then we start to produce a harvest? We start to go out and we start to share God's word to everybody else. Because it's the fruitful soil that inherits the kingdom. The unfruitful soil does not. And Jesus is at pains to, to explain that there's a difference between the crowds that come and listen to him speaking and to him preaching and the, and the people who've repented and changed their lives, their hearts have changed and they're following after Jesus with a sincerity to do what he wants them to do and to listen to what he has to say and to ask the questions when they don't understand what he's talking about, they go and ask him the question and he explains to them in plain speech because their heart is to learn what the gospel has and what it will do in unlocking their lives and changing them. There is something that's going on in this story. It can go on in the world and it can happen even in our own church. We can have people who are attending church at this moment in time. They are listening to the word of God being preached to them and nothing happens. They hear it, it's snatched away. If the root doesn't go down deep enough and the worries and cares of the world take it away. Or they're so concerned with wealth and their lives and their families and everything else that they have in this world that they don't have time to sow into the kingdom of God and to reap a harvest. As well as also happening in the world. There are so many people out there who are so busy just choosing to do things and listen to other voices and other words that they don't have time for the word of God to hear or to be spoken into their lives.
and to transform it. Jesus goes on to explain the parable. He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocking ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. In other words, it sounds very much like they've made a decision for God. They've received it. They've, they've repented of their situation. They've asked Jesus into their lives. But they don't allow it to sink deep down inside. It doesn't take root. It only lasts for a short time. And when problems start to come, troubles and persecution, because they say that they believe in Jesus and that they're, they're Christians, all of a sudden they fade away and they think, I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be upset. I'm going to stay silent. I'm not going to produce a harvest. I don't think I can cope with this Christian faith. I'm going to find something else. They go off somewhere else. Only lasts a short time. Because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling on the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. Here is another person who's received the word of God. They've received the gospel. They're about to make a change. But hang on a second. I want to make money over here. Or I don't have enough money to feed my mouths. So, you know what? I, I, I'm, I need to make more. I need to work more days. I, I can't take the time out. I can't spend the time in God's word. I can't. Their lives become choked with the worries and the cares of life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes the word and makes it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. It is this the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. So we see here that 25% of what is sown actually responds in the right way to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the right way? The right way is not only just to receive the gospel, but also to become fruitful because of it. And so Jesus is talking about his own disciples. He's talking about the differentiating between the crowd that follows after him just wanting the tidbits, just wanting to feel the goosebumps, so to speak, and those who are effective in serving him and picking up the plow or picking up their own cross and following after him. In Matthew 13, 24 to 30, Jesus then goes on to talk about another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you were pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jesus goes on to interpret this parable. He left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the e enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his, of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This other parable comes at the field of the evangelist in another dimension. 
Instead of seeing it from an earthly perspective, Jesus is talking it from a spiritual perspective, from a heavenly perspective. The Son of Man he refers to as himself. It's the Christ. And then the servants that we see working in the field are the angels. The field obviously being the world of man in which we live, in which we dwell. And then we see two types of seed. One which is the wheat, those who follow after the word of God and has the effect of being fruitful in life. And on the other hand, we have the weeds, those who listen to the words of Satan, the words of this world, and are so focused on his message rather than the gospel of Jesus. And this is the field that the evangelist works in knowing that when he scatters the seed, there will be some who will grow up and who will be wheat. And there are others who will grow up and they will be weeds. But isn't it interesting, it's not until the heads start to come on the wheat that you can discern between the weeds and the wheat. In other words, it's not until the wheat becomes mature that you can tell the difference between the weeds. And so when we're sowing and when we're out there evangelizing to people, we don't know the fullness of the harvest until we see the maturity in those who've received the gospel. And we need to persevere in the field until we see that maturity, to know that those people truly are in a good place and that they're saved and that they're sanctified and that God has blessed them. It's a way of measuring but isn't it amazing how God in his gracefulness refuses to just pull up the wheat and the tares together while it's there. He waits patiently until the end, till all have had the opportunity to grow to that place of maturity so that nobody will be lost, nobody will be damaged, that you won't pull up wheat accidentally and mix it with the tares. No, God is allowing humanity this grace, this time, this moment to choose whether it will be a wheat or whether it will be a tear. To have the opportunity to change their lives and their lifetimes. To repent, to come to know Jesus, to admit that your own ways and the ways of the world are not working and that you need to learn the ways and the word of God for your life so that you may mature in the right way. Because if you don't seek to learn after his ways and his words and implement his gospel in your life, then your fate is like the tares that are thrown or the weeds that are thrown into the fire to be consumed and to be burned. This parable takes a lot from Daniel chapter 7. It refers to the Son of Man and in that particular text, when it refers to the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, this is what it says. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man. Referring to Jesus. The Son of Man is the term that Jesus refers to himself. It's referring to the sower or the farmer who owns the field. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient days, which is God on high, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His, dom his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the gospel that we should be giving to those who do not know who Jesus is. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His dominion will not pass away. And yet we are called to be his followers and to be his servants. And if we do not bow the knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our fate is the fate of the, of the weeds to be burned and to be thrown away. But if we do follow after the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our fate is to be welcomed into his barn, to be welcomed into the house of God. What does Jesus say? Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, 
let them hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I hope you're blessed, church, by this message. Have a great week. Until the next time, take care.